you've done a lot of research into the psychology of, of scientific consensus. Could you yeah. describe some of the key findings and particularly what you mean by gateway belief and, and why that's important? Sure. So, um, so we, we try to understand how the public, what do they understand about uh, is climate change happening? Is it human caused? Do they worry about it? Do they see it as an important and serious problem? Uh, and so on and so forth, policy support and, and behavior. And one of the five key things that we've uh, identified, and so let me back up for a second. Uh, in, in some ways, you know, it, it would be wonderful, it would be fantastic, in fact, if everyone on Earth could have the equivalent of Climate Change 101. Okay? Full semester course devoted to really understanding, here's how the climate system works, here's what the causes are, here's what the consequences are going to be, here's what we can do about it. Um, and the sad fact is, is that the vast majority of humanity will never have Climate Change 101. It's just never, ever going to happen. Now when I say that, I don't mean that there aren't, in fact, millions of people around the world who do want that information. They're hungry for it. They're asking for it. And I think it, it's incumbent upon us in the climate community to do everything we can to go more than halfway to try to meet them and answer those questions and, and to co-produce knowledge with them about here's what climate change is and here's why it, it, it's so important. Um, but that's not the vast majority of what is now nearly seven and a half billion people. Okay? Uh, they don't have the time, they don't have the background, they don't have the training, they don't have the interest. They've got other fundamentally more pressing problems than understanding how a climate system works. Um, so one of the fundamental challenges from a communication standpoint in that context, and this is the challenge I'll put to you and your colleagues and your students, is if you've only got enough shelf space in most people's heads for a limited set of ideas, and let's just say it's five ideas, what five ideas would you want them to know? Okay. That's really the critical question for most people. What are the five key things that you would want them to know so they can make, they can understand what's happening today and they can make informed decisions about the future? Okay. Uh, now that's an interesting question because then you throw that back. You think, well, okay, do they need to know exactly how many parts per million of carbon dioxide are in the atmosphere? Probably not. Do they need to know exactly how the carbon cycle works? Probably not. Uh, do they need to understand the complex interactions between the cryosphere and the atmosphere and the biosphere and, and so on? Probably not. Um, and in the, I'd say it's an open question and it's certainly a question that may differ for different countries or even different specific uh, 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 groups within a country. Uh, so farmers are, are certainly going to have a slightly different set of, of needs than others. But in our work and others uh, in this field, I we think here's what we would say are the five key ideas that we think are, are critical that everybody start with at least. And that is uh, five key beliefs in just ten words. It's real. It's us. It's bad. The experts agree. And there's hope. Okay? That's it. If you basically have those core concepts about the problem, that it is real and that we are the ones causing it and that it is bad, these are what we might call meta-beliefs. Okay? Uh, because you can instantiate, you can describe, you can uh, uh, ex um, extend each of those with thousands of examples. Here's all the ways that we know that it's happening. Here are the many different ways that we know that it's human caused and not volcanoes and not the sun and not just natural cycles and not, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, here are the thousands and thousands of ways that it's going to be bad, okay, uh, and so on. But each of those are metacognitions, okay, these five key ideas. You can provide examples that support each of those five ideas with all the additional information that's in the press and the media and education and conversation and so on about why this problem exists and why it's important to deal with. So anyway, those are five basic ideas that we think are, are particularly important that uh, most people need to understand. And that fourth one, back to your question, is that the experts agree. Um, that we have found in our work to be a pretty consequential um, uh, belief because 
first of all, we've identified in our work, and this is particularly true of the United States, I think it's also true uh, to a uh, significant extent in Australia, uh, certainly in Canada and the UK, notice all English-speaking countries, um, that uh, uh, very few Americans understand the nature of the consensus. So in the US, in our latest survey, I think we found this just slightly over one out of ten Americans understands that more than 90 percent of the experts, climate scientists, the people who study this day in, day out, published in the peer-reviewed journals, uh, uh, believe that and, and are convinced, based upon the evidence, that climate change is happening and human caused. Okay? About which there is really no legitimate dispute within the scientific community. And yet only one in ten Americans understands that, that, that it's an overwhelming consensus. Um, that's not by accident. That is uh, for a whole host of reasons. Partly, going back to what we said, is that I think scientists do bear some of the blame. They don't, they haven't communicated this fact very well. Uh, and partly that's because of scientific norms and, and scientific expectations. Um, as a scientist, I don't get any credit for repeating what everybody already knows and accepts. You know, that's why when you publish a paper in physics, you don't have to say, oh, by the way, gravity exists. Right? Everybody just accepts that as a basic reality. Um, and scientists, and I th for a whole host of reasons, including the, just the discipline of science, uh, have a default assumption that, hey, look, I said it once. Right? I wrote it in a paper and I published it once. I don't get any credit for repeating it again. In fact, I'll get uh, slammed by peer reviewers for repeating the same uh, basic fact again. That's great within the context of scientific journals. It's terrible from the context of communicating to the public because, in fact, they haven't heard you. I mean, there's a simple formulation that we've used uh, in the past is that to be an effective communicator, you need simple, clear, and compelling messages, repeated often, 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 probably at least seven times. Um, in fact, they're probably only hearing you the, by the time that you're so sick of hearing the words come out of your mouth again for the nth time. Um, that's probably when people finally have the ability to hear you. And then last point in that formulation, by a variety of trusted messengers, and that too is really critical. Um, so uh, the fact is, is that scientists haven't done a very good job of even expressing the things that they all know and accept. Uh, to a broader public that needs to hear it again and again and again. Um, but that's not the bigger reason why there's such a disconnect between people's understanding of that consensus and the reality of that consensus, which of course has existed for decades. Uh, the other is, of course, there's been a massive disinformation campaign. Very well funded, very well organized, very good, very good effect, uh, effective communicators. Uh, and very well documented by a variety of, of researchers. So could you bring it? Um, back to the concept of the gateway belief, why what people sure. think about consensus matters. Sure. So what we have found, first of all empirically, is that when you simply expose people to the fact of the consensus, and that a tiny exposure, showing it to them once in the form of a pie chart or just a text description, uh, that 97 percent of climate scientists are convinced, based upon the evidence, that climate change is happening in human caused, or alternatively, that human caused global warming is happening. Um, we find consistently through many different experiments, as also verified by lots of other researchers, that you can move people pretty substantially, 15, 20 percentage points in their understanding of that consensus. In other words, people move from saying, oh, maybe 30 percent of scientists uh, are, have reached that conclusion to now suddenly saying that it's 45 or 50 percent, okay? Um, so one is that you can move people's understanding of the consensus quite a bit, and that makes sense because you've just given them a little piece of information that they didn't ever, they'd never seen before. Um, but what makes it consequential and why we call it a gateway belief is that it then seems to have cascading effects, that essentially people uh, uh, begin to, even with this tiny little intervention, to then say, well, if the experts agree, then I think it's, a, it's 
happening, and I think it's human caused, and I think it's a serious problem. And then in turn, they become more supportive of policy action and even more willing to take personal action. Okay? And that's why we call it a gateway belief, is that shifting that fundamental understanding that the scientists agree can have these cascading effects. Um, and when you step back and you think about it, it, it makes a lot of sense because, look, you know, most lay people don't know a climate scientist. Uh, you know, it's not like this is information they're learning over their backyard fence. Um, they don't read the IPCC reports. I'm sorry to say to my many colleagues in the climate science community, they're not reading your papers. Um, they have no direct interaction with climate science itself. Um, uh, uh, and likewise, of course, climate change itself to the average person is not directly, not directly perceivable. You cannot per directly perceive climate change. You can directly experience some of the outcomes, you know, an extreme event as an example, or flooding or, uh, or a heat wave. But even those, you don't know that it's climate change until you've gotten the concept of climate change in your head that can help you interpret that heat wave as something other than just a heat wave. Right? Um, so for many people, because they only learn about this through the media, uh, and because of the way that the media has reported this, and because of this disinformation campaign, and the fact that scientists haven't repeatedly said, yes, we agree, this is happening in human cause over and over again, many people have this false understanding, false uh, uh, perception, that uh, scientists are still arguing about whether the problem even exists. You and I are sitting here at the end of 2015, and many, many people still think that experts are still arguing about whether climate change is even real. Okay? Now, if you're a layperson and you don't know much about this issue, um, what's the rational thing to do is to say, well, I'm going to kind of take a wait and see attitude. You know, it's basically saying, scientists, you're the experts, go off in a room, Argue it out, figure it out, and when you do, you'll come and tell us, right? Okay. Uh, and when you do, and if you say that this is serious, then we'll take it. Then we'll take the appropriate step to say, okay, then let's deal with it. Um, not knowing, of course, that scientists went into that room and reached those conclusions literally decades ago. Okay. And that's why that consensus is a really important belief. Um, now, that's not to say that there aren't plenty of people who are also confused about the consensus, who nonetheless themselves have already accepted that climate change is happening and human cause in a very serious issue, but they've reached that conclusion for other reasons, you know, often dealing with their underlying values. Um, so I wouldn't say the consensus is a magic bullet. It's not. Okay? It is not. But it is certainly a message that has these cascading effects that we think is really critical. And the most important thing is, is that it's fundamentally true. It's just the truth. And that's all it is. It's not spin. It's not uh, emotionally laden language. It's just a basic fact is that the people who study this, the experts, have completely concluded that this is a uh, very real and human caused problem. So you've uh, tested a number of ways of communicating the consensus. Yeah. What have you found are the more effective ways of? Of getting that message across? Well, I think much still needs to be done to figure that question out, but in, at least in terms of uh, what we've tried, we, we've looked at, for instance, trying to convey that uh, message in the form of a pie chart uh, versus a simple text description of 97% of climate scientists, blah, 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 uh, versus using a metaphor. Um, and basically what we have found is that the simpler the better for this particular message. Um, in other words, the pie chart actually worked the best. Uh, I think it's visual, it's graphic, people immediately see it, they, they understand what the 97% means without having to get a number and then you know, uh, process it cognitively and try to figure out, well, is that you know, a big percentage or whatever. I mean, 97% is not hard to, to think about, but it does take a little more uh, thinking than, say, just seeing a, a picture, a graph. Uh, of a pie chart with a very thin sliver representing the 3% and this massive space representing the, the other 97. Um, so thus far, I would say that's what we have found, is that the pie chart seems to work the best, though all, uh, all three approaches do work.
about a year before your pie chart study was published, we uh, launched the consensus project and we right. used the pie chart use forming the pie chart. a little C. Right. Um, and then when your study came out, we thought, phew, lucky I did it that way. <laughs> All right. No, you, you nailed it. Um, so, um, so there's been, since over the last couple of years, there's been a great, um, I guess, increase in interest from scholars about consensus messaging, mm -hmm. whether it's the, um, uh, like uh, whether it's an effective, um, I guess, approach or whether mm. we should even be doing it. Right. Uh, and so there's been a, a number of objections to consensus messaging. Could, yeah. could I um, mention a few and, and just get your response? To sure, that? to the extent that I can answer them. So one is that, um, and you referred to this earlier, talking about scientific norms, mm. is that scientists should be talking about evidence, not about consensus. Mm. Mm. Well, except that evidence is just that. I mean, it's, it's like I said, you know, data is useless until it's been transmuted into knowledge. And in fact, I'd even go further and say knowledge isn't very useful until it's been transmuted into wisdom uh, and judgment. Um, so yeah, you can collect and describe all the evidence that you want, but in the end, you have to have some sort of conclusion. And that is the power of consensus, is that it says that as a community of scholars, not just a bunch of independent researchers, and here's the thousand papers and so on, which of course no one will ever, in the lay public or policy makers, ever going to go and assemble their own conclusion by reading every single one of these papers and, and saying, oh wow, they all reached the same basic conclusion that climate change is happening in human cause. Uh, you have to have concluding statements. It's why the IPCC reports exist. Right? You need some sort of consensus type documents from a body of experts saying that, you know, and that's one of the great strengths of the scientific process itself is that it is a, um, it is a network, it is a process of individual researchers each independently asking and answering the same questions and in, in uh, the best cases reaching the same conclusions because they're finding that all the lines of evidence converge in the same place, right? Uh, then you need to be able to communicate that to the rest of the world, right? Um, and so that's been critically important for, you know, all kinds of, I mean, basically every kind of science needs to have these consensus statements. I mean, even to the basic level of things that don't affect your daily life, like plate tectonics, except of course plate tectonics can influence your daily life too if you <laughs> happen to live in an earthquake zone. Uh, but, uh, but then you have much more socially relevant uh, uh, concerns like, for instance, the impact of cigarette smoking on, on health. Um, the consensus statement by the U.S. Surgeon General way back in the 1950s was a critical turning point uh, in the long and too long uh, evolution of the American response to that, that health hazard. Uh, you need those statements uh, in order to galvanize and engage uh, the broader public. Another argument is that we should be talking about solutions uh, rather than talking about consensus, that, it, that consensus distracts from where the discussion should be happening. Oh, I, it's, that's like, but that's an either or argument, and it's not an either or, it's a both and. Of course we need to talk about solutions. but. You know, part of the problem is, and this gets complicated depending on which audience you're talking about, so that's a longer discussion. But, you know, for many people, it's, you can't really talk about solutions unless they understand that there's an underlying problem that you're trying to solve, right? And one of the ways that you help them understand that there's a real problem we need to solve is that they know that the experts have reached agreement that, hey, everyone, we have a problem. So, you know, it, it is more complicated than that. There are ways to help get some people to support solutions without ever accepting the reality of climate change. Um, but that's a, that's a different uh, uh, kind of a problem. Dan Kahan argues that because public perception of consensus hasn't shifted that much over the last decade or so, yeah. when we have been communicating consensus, that therefore consensus messaging mustn't work. Yeah, well, I think that's just, it's, it, he has a very, uh, I think, limited view of the reach of that message. I mean, that gets back to what that simple formulation I was using before. Repeat often, repeat often, repeat often, repeat often, repeat often, repeat often, repeat often. It has not been repeated often. This is not a dominant message. I mean, we show that. I mean, the, I think the evidence itself shows, first of all, 
descriptively in America, and, and I'll limit my comments to the United States, uh, one in 10 Americans understands the consensus now. So clearly they don't get it yet. Uh, I think the very fact that repeated experiments show that you can move people as much as 15 to 20 points in their perception of that, of the degree of that consensus, with a single exposure to the consensus itself, shows they've never seen it, right? It's the very fact that they move so quickly and easily uh, in and of itself demonstrates that they've just never seen it. Because if they had seen it before, they'd already have moved. Well, Kahan argues that those type of experiments, therefore, mustn't be externally valid because if it happens in the lab, but it's not happening in the real world. I would, so you could take it from that standpoint then someone needs to do the media analysis to show me that the consensus message has, uh, has, uh, has received uh, real reach. And I don't just mean, okay, I can count up 200 news, you know, newspaper stories that have mentioned the scientific consensus. That's not reach. It's not even close to reach. You've got to understand the, the social and cultural and media landscape of a country and just think about the challenge of reaching 300 million people with any message. If you are Coke or Pepsi and you're launching a product, you're likely to spend a billion dollars on advertising to get that message out. And it is bombarding you with the same, I mean, and the best possible advertising you can buy, right? Uh, over and over and over and over and over again on television, on radio, in newspapers, and billboards, and I mean they want to hit you with that new product uh, as many times as they can. I dare anybody to show me where the consensus message has gotten even a hundredth of a one percent of the kind of exposure uh, that those kinds of uh, communication campaigns have had. So I just don't buy the argument that um, it's been tried and it doesn't work. I just don't think we've ever tried it. He also argues that um, consensus messaging can be polarizing. What does your data say about that? Uh, that's certainly not what we find. Um, what, one of the things that was actually most interesting and actually a surprise in the very first study, and it's been replicated ever since, uh, is that actually the consensus message works with uh, both Democrats and independents and Republicans. And in fact, we have consistently found that the consensus message seems to have the greatest impact among Republicans. Uh, the very political group within the United States that are the most uh, hostile to the very reality of climate change. Okay? Um, the one that for their own, and I'm just now limiting my comments to those that are really the hardcore Republicans who that's part of their core identity, and I think it's also really important to separate that out and realize that is not the vast majority of Americans. Most Americans do not define themselves through being Democrat or Republican. Um, it's actually a relatively small base. This is the base, right? This is the whole, whole argument that we're seeing right now in the primary discussions is how do you activate and engage the base? Because they're the ones that choose who the nominee for, for instance, president will be. Um, those are the people who are the most attuned to the to the messages and the, and the framings and the arguments of political elites. And even among th those strong Republicans, we find that that consensus message uh, works uh, pretty effectively. So yeah, we, we don't find any empirical evidence, uh, certainly in now I think six of these uh, experiments, uh, to suggest that it, it backfires.